My name is uh, Sam Ben Yaakov or Shmuel Ben Yaakov in Hebrew. I'm very happy to be here and I like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me. Originally, they've asked me to talk about the uh, future of power electronics. And I said, I'd rather talk about the present of power electronics. And uh, I brought here a presentation which is titled uh, Ferroelectric Ceramic Capacitors, There is More Than Meets the Eye. And what I'm going to do is to, sh to show some of the intricate characteristic of this very uh, popular element, a uh, ceramic capacitor. Now, a few words about the presentation. Uh, I'm going to record this um, uh, session, and I'm going to put it in my uh, YouTube channel, which is uh, shown here. And also, I'm inviting whoever is interested in uh, joining the LinkedIn uh, group on power electronics that I've uh, started. And finally, there are papers in our uh, university uh, website. And here is my email, so if there is an interest in con contacting me, here is it's very simple, S-B-Y-B-G-U-A-C-I-L. Now I'm going to record it, and in order to record it properly, I'd like to show the um, pointer. For that, I'll have to sit. So I'm not going to stand and sit. I hope you won't take it as disrespect or anything of this nature. So, let me say a few words about uh, why uh, ceramic capacitors and what's the reason for this presentation. Now, ceramic capacitors are very uh, popular. In fact, if you're going to use Viker modules, you probably would need quite... Oh, okay. Uh, if you're going to use uh, Viker modules, you probably would need uh, quite a number of capacitors around it for decoupling, uh, bypassing, etc. And uh, they're very popular and uh, used. If you open whatever uh, electronic device, you'll see tens, if not hundreds, of ceramic capacitors there. And yet, it's very interesting that many of the characteristics of the ceramic capacitor are really unknown. And in fact, there many are, uh, uh, has to be still investigated and discovered. And this is what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to cover a little bit, sort of a, get a common denominator here, but then show some of the uh, aspects of these devices, which are very important in just any power electronics uh, design, uh, which are less known and uh, that to, we are working on, and uh, in fact, I'm going to show some uh, very recent results uh, that we have obtained. So the outline in general looks like that. Uh, we're going to, first of all, cover a little bit, a very general characteristic of uh, ceramic capacitors, uh, just to get, again, the common denominator here. And I'm going to talk about three uh, points. One is the effect of bias voltage on ESR, which is very little known about it, piezoelectricity, and also talk about nonlinear capacitor modeling. Uh, I hope I have the time. If not, I'll leave it for the future. So uh, let me go ahead and just mention that if there are any questions, please don't hesitate. You can just uh, ask within the presentation. Let's not wait uh, to the end of it. Okay, now we are all familiar with ceramic capacitors. Uh, we have the through hole, we have the uh, SMT types, uh, multi layer, disc, etc. Very popular. And as it turns out, we have uh, two basic types we have the para electric type um, capacitors, which is known in, in the industry is known as class A or 1. And these are like the NPO. Uh, capacitors. And then we have the ferroelectric capacitors, which are very popular because of their small size. I'll talk about it. And uh, I'm concentrated about these, which are very peculiar and have many features that really are interesting. And then um, <coughs> the class two and three, uh, which are the ferroelectric, are really uh, 
nice because they have a high dielectric constant, so um, you can build small capacitors uh, in small size, large capacitance, which you cannot do, by the way, with the power electric, with the NPO, because the dielectric constant is not that large, so this is why we don't have uh, high capacitance with the NPO version. Now, again, we have the classes, and uh, the NPO is used more in a more critical application, like resonant converters, high Q, etc., when you need high stability. And uh, while the uh, class two and three, like class two is the X7R, which is very, very popular, uh, is very widely used because of the small size and again, uh, today is a re relatively uh, low cost, low price. Now, what is uh, ferroelectricity? Ferroelectricity is uh, sort of similar to uh, ferromagnetism. And what it is, is a, uh, the fact that we have uh, electrical domain, field domain within the device, and we have a moment there uh, of a dipole, and the Polarization means that the ability of the device to store charge. And in the case of the ferroelectric, it's nonlinear, and that's part of the problem that I'm going to talk about. So if I look and just in a very, very simple and uh, intuitive way explain what we are talking about, here is a hysteresis loop of a ferroelectric material, like material like X7R. And uh, the area, of course, is related to the power loss because the integral here, this is Q, this is uh, charge, and this is voltage. Uh, the integral is energy. And uh, times you go around this loop, uh, it, whether it's a minor or, or major loop, uh, you'll lose energy. And this is the ESR we're going to talk about. And so, Pictorially, what happens is that at the beginning we have all these domains uh, randomly arranged, and as we expose the unit to a voltage, they are organized like this and this, and then um, uh, as we go through the loop, it will, of course, change the orientation. So here we have, this is just a simple uh, dielectric uh, material. This is a paraelectric, and this is the ferroelectric. Now, when we talk about capacitance, what we mean actually is the derivative or the slope of this curve, of this uh, hysteresis uh, curve. And um, being uh, nonlinear like this, obviously the uh, slope here is much smaller than the slope here. And this is why these capacitors, as you expose them to voltage and you go up here or you go up here, will change the capacitance and you, their capacitance is going to drop, and some of them quite a bit, a lot. For example, in this example, we're talking about the X5R, for example, uh, down by 80%. That is, you are left with only 20% of the capacitance that you think you have, uh, and this is within the voltage uh, of the device. I mean, I'm not talking about over voltage or anything like that. So this is something that many, know about it, of course, many designers. Some are a little bit unaware, and this is something to take into account that uh, you are losing capacitance as you bias the device. So here is an, uh, just an example again. Um, we have uh, the NPO, which is very stable with voltage, X7R, and here's another example of another one. But uh, there is another aspect, of course, and that the temperature dependence, the NPO uh, the, is, is the best. And uh, then we have the various materials would have different temperature dependence. And X7R is kind of a good compromise, and this is why it is very, very popular, of course. Now, when we're talking about the behavior or the electrical behavior of a capacitor, we have to take into account that we have a equivalent series resistor, equivalent series inductance, and a decapacitance. The uh, these two, the inductance and capacitance, have a resonant frequency, and we see here this is the impedance, 
of the capacitor, and here is the resonant circuit, uh, uh, resonant frequency. We see a drop here, and the value here, of course, is the ESR. This is this uh, equivalent series resistor, and um, here the touch, of course, because uh, the impedance is the ESR. But what I'm going to uh, stress, and I'm going to elaborate on it, that the ESR is a function of frequency. It's uh, changing with frequency. Why is that? That is because we are going through the hysteresis loop more and more times. There, therefore, the loss of energy is higher and higher. And then we um, have uh, here uh, the dependence on, uh, of the capacitance, which is uh, on frequency, which is not that high. Now, power dissipation. Um, it's dependent on the ESR, and we have an RMS current uh, flowing through the device, uh, depending on the uh, thermal um, resistance or transfer. Uh, we're going to have a temperature rise. This is temperature rise, and this is the current, and this is for different frequencies. Here, ESR is low, so we have here the, uh, we can go to a higher current with the lower uh, temperature drop. Uh, while here, the ESR is high, uh, uh, the temperature rise is uh, faster, okay? I'm again, this is just a background, uh, just to have a common language here. Uh, just to mention that uh, in many times we are connecting um, you know, two capacitors in, in parallel, uh, 0.1 microfarad is put anywhere, and uh, because not many, I found that not many engineers know, wha know why, because uh, usually I'm asking, why do you put uh, in parallel to a 10 microfarad, a 0.1 microfarad? He says, well, that's the way it's done. I mean, you always put the 0.1. <laughs> well, the reason is, of course, that uh, the larger capacitor has a larger inductance, so the resonant frequency is uh, lower and pretty soon it's uh, losing its uh, capacitance behavior, it's becoming inductance, while the point one has a higher frequency, a resonant frequency, so at this frequency, of course, uh, uh, the point one is doing the, the work while the, the 10 microfarad is already high impedance. Now, not many people are aware of the fact that at this cross point there is a problem, and in many times I've seen it's showing up in that they, there is a inductance here, in fact, inductor, and here is capacitance, and the value is the same, so you have a resonant frequency here, and many times you have oscillation uh, at this frequency, and uh, people are just wondering how come we are, have all these parasitic oscillation, and this is uh, one of the reasons many times you have to actually damp it in order to avoid the oscillation. Okay. Now, as I've said, uh, although capacitors are used a lot, uh, again, even with the data sheet, there are some mysteries. For example, if I look at the data sheet here of this capacitor, I see here a curve which shows the capacitance dropping with voltage, quite a bit. This one has to realize is done, or oh, this curve is obtained by small signal and biasing here and getting the value of the capacitance. This, so this is like a small signal capacitance. On the other hand, we see here another curve. It says capacitance too. And here all of the sudden, this is voltage now, AC, and here all of a sudden you see a peak. So wh wh why is this peak? I mean, how, how, did, it, how did it come out? I'll talk about, about it a little bit later. And this is just to show that, you know, you look at data sheet and some, some mysteries here. And this is aside from the fact that some things which are not in the data sheet. Another point that uh, I like to uh, show here is that not many are aware of the fact that the dependence, this is from a, uh, a paper by Maxim, and that the dependence of the capacitance on the voltage is a function of the package. And the, the smaller the package, the larger is usually the drop. And the reason is that uh, 
in order to get a small package, you expose the material to a higher electric field. So you're going up on the hysteresis curve, and therefore uh, the drop becomes very much larger. So if you are worried about this, uh, you have to be aware that you can uh, choose a larger size, and the drop will be lower. Okay, so here we see this is a 10 microfarad, 10 volt capacitor, same material. The only difference is the package. And here you see a, a huge <laughs> drop, and here it's really moderate. And same thing here, it's a 10 microfarad, uh, it's another material, okay? So these are the very common um, features and, and characteristics, and there are so many which I'm not going into. So let me now move into something which is less known. And that is the fact that ESR, which we all are aware of and, 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 and worry about because this is what is causing losses and heating up of the capacitor um, is a function of the bias. And uh, if we consider, let me go back here, consider here what we see here that the cap with the voltage the capacitance is dropping. It's becoming a smaller capacitor or the capacitance is becoming smaller. So if you think about it, you say, okay, if I have a big capacitor, and say I'm splitting it into two parts, the ESR of each one part will be larger because uh, when they are coming back together in parallel, uh, it's the original ESR. So the capacitance is becoming smaller, but the ESR should be larger. So reason or oh, the logic thinking, logical thinking would say that as the voltage goes up and the capacitance goes down, uh, you'd expect a higher ESR. And I was surprised that there's no information about that. Is it so or is it not? So I initiated a study on that. In fact, I collaborated with a guy from Austria of all places in a uh, university there and then uh, from uh, also Omicron uh, company. And we started to look into this and then we were surprised that uh, there are um, papers about it too, but uh, they didn't seem to be really conclusive. So again, my question was, when you go from this capacitance to this capacitance, at the same frequency, is the ESR the same or not? Now this is a very important question. It's not uh, a, an academic question. Because if you design a power supply, say a buck converter, the capacitor is exposed to a voltage. Now the uh, losses are a function of the current going through this capacitor and the ESR. Now if now we are exposing this, this capacitor to a voltage, if the ESR is the same as the in the data sheet, okay. But if not, you have to know it because this will change uh, your consideration. You can choose another capacitor. So this is not something, uh, you know, curiosity. This is something of importance. And as I've said, I've found that um, there are a couple of papers. For example, here's a paper here, which shows that a specific capacitor, when exposed to a voltage, DC voltage, the capacitance is becoming smaller, it's 200 to 45, we know that. Inductance is about the same, makes sense, but the ESR becoming larger, and that, that's a big change. That's be, be, between 77 milliohms to 300, so it, it's, it's a big change. And um, so I was, again, very curious about it, and we set up a set of measurements to see what, what's all about. And here's the setup. Uh, this is around a uh, network analyzer by Omicron, Body 100. It's a power supply. Uh, the circuit is very simple. You take the unit, expose it to DC. Uh, of course, there is a decoupling capacitor, again, another <laughs> capacitor. And um, you measure the ESR under various uh, voltages. And uh, this is just the setup of the Body 100. And indeed, we have found that these are two scans. This is frequency, this is ESR. ESR is going down with frequency. 
And with zero bias, uh, you see one value, and 400, this is a high voltage capacitor, uh, 400 volt bias is certainly higher, no question about that. And uh, then we found another paper, and they did something similar. This is the setup. Uh, they use this, cap this capacitor, but they have found very huge changes, uh, which didn't make sense uh, to me. The, the, the tenfold, like between 10 milliohms to 120 milliohms. That's, that's a very, very big change because if you take a capacitor, you think it's 10 milliohm and it's 100, that it makes a big difference. It's not uh, that's something uh, uh, to ignore. So again, we set up to measure uh, the thing a little bit better. And then I found something interesting that KMAT, uh, KMAT, which is capacitor manufacturer, has a online simulator. And with this simulator, you can put in the component, uh, I mean, the catalog number, and this is something you need. I haven't found it any other place. You can change the bias voltage. That is, you change the bias voltage and you can get ESR as a function of frequency uh, for different uh, bias voltages of this capacitor. And lo and behold, we found that in this simulator, as the voltage goes up, the ESR goes down in all capacitors that we measure. So this really intrigued me. I mean, so something's <laughs> wrong here. So which one is, is correct? Because if it's going down, that's beautiful. I mean, if, if you have a capacitor and you bias it and the ESR is, is even lower, well, thanks. But uh, if it's higher, then you have to know. So we set up another set of measurements. And um, uh, again, I've been working with this guy, Hermann Hag, who is uh, from Austria. At that time, he did his thesis on this uh, subject. And he did a lot of measurement, a lot, a lot of measurement. And we have found that in general, ESR is going up, going up. There's a mistake in the simulator of Kamet. It's incorrect. Uh, this brings me to this, uh, maybe, you know, all we know about it. But sometimes we think that, you know, when the vendors are giving us a data sheet or reference design, it's like some angel, uh, and some superhuman people uh, uh, composed it, but uh, you know, we are all uh, subject to mistakes and uh, the simulator is incorrect. That's what it is. So, go ahead. It was a marketing. Yeah, system. okay. So yeah, done by the marketing people. Okay, so uh, here we see that for, for this particular one, there is a increase and in this one, it's not so much. And it's just as a summary, and for various uh, capacitors that were measured, and uh, we see that in general, uh, when we you go to uh, higher voltages, and all these are dependent on the, of course, rating of these capacitors, we are talking about 30 percent, sometimes even 60 percent uh, change, which is not insignificant. While in the uh, KMET. Uh, uh, simulator, you see that's all negative, and uh, also the numbers are even bigger, which are just incorrect. So, uh, my quest for manufacture of, of capacitor to provide this information, this is something that uh, has to be put in the data sheet, and they are not doing that. Uh, many are not aware, I was talking to a number of manufacturers, and they're surprised to find out that uh, ESR is dependent on the voltage. Uh, and uh, this is something which is <coughs> absolutely missing from the uh, uh, data sheet. So uh, let me move now to another subject, which is piezoelectricity, <coughs> which is also, yes, please. Do you know what's the reason of increasing uh, of ESR? Well, uh, I have an intuitive explanation, uh, but uh, I, I, we don't have a, a, good, a good explanation that nobody has actually studied it. Uh, we know this is the phenomena. It's so documented by us. There are some papers. In the papers, all are increasing. Only the simulator is, is decreasing. And uh, we really don't know. Maybe uh, 
uh, by compressing, uh, uh, you know, imposing the, uh, my intuitive sort of understanding, uh, by imposing the voltage, you are compressing the uh, dipoles, and maybe then it becomes more difficult, so to, to the friction, so to speak, is becoming larger. I don't know, but uh, this is something that has to be looked at. So let me move about piezoelectricity. Uh, ferroelectric materials are, have this uh, property of piezoelectricity. What is piezoelectricity? It's a uh, dependence uh, between mechanical stress and electrical uh, properties. That is, if you take a piezoelectric material and you compress it or bend it, you get a voltage or, or electric field. And on the other hand, if you put an electric field uh, on it, you impose on it, uh, you can bend it or, or twist it uh, from the mechanical point of view. So, um, of course, piezoelectric uh, material are used in many applications, speakers, microphones, and things like that. But uh, in the case of a ceramic capacitor, this is not a desirable uh, feature. Uh, this is something that you get because the material is uh, ferroelectric and uh, is a piezoelectric. And uh, some people have done some experiments with this. And for example, this is a paper that was written by <laughs> people from Kemet, as a matter of fact. What they did, they, they took uh, putting a capacitor on a PCB and then exposed it to a rather low frequency, AC and measure the sound. Uh, I don't know if uh, ever all of you or some of you have ever noticed, but there are cases in which the PCB is singing because of the capacitor. So this is this phenomenon that, that uh, it's uh, emitting audio due to this uh, AC through it. And uh, they are showing that um, the uh, amount of uh, audio is a function, of course, of the voltage. This is for 10 hertz, and this is one kilohertz. And, uh, well, the point of this paper is to show that they have a line of capacitors in which the ends are put on, on a uh, flexible uh, part or junction such that uh, when the capacitor is singing or, or vibrating, it is not transferring to the, to the board. So it's a flexible uh, connection. And this is this uh, COLF. And this, of course, has a lower emission of audio. But this is not what I wanted to show you. Uh, what I want to show is this. And this is very interesting. When you uh, scan the frequency, and you measure ESR, say with a, analog, with a network analyzer, you find that around the resonant point, you have peaks. And these peaks are probably due to um, resonant, piezoelectric resonant of the device around this value. <laughs> so we also set up to investigate these things. And here, what we found, and this, this was done by the same guy. And uh, you see here, and we found something which is, uh, I think, new. Nobody ever seen that. That the amount of oscillation, this is an oscillation. That is, this is a scan of frequency measuring the ESR. And this is without bias. And this is with bias. And it turns out that as you increase the bias, these oscill parasitic oscillations are becoming larger and larger. Uh, this is very dangerous, by the way. It can actually break, crack the, uh, uh, the device, the ceramic, because if you are in this a neighborhood, uh, this could be a big problem. So we set up to do the measurement. And I did it uh, part in my lab and some in, in Austria. And the idea is, again, we have a, this is part of the analyzer. Uh, we have two capacitors which are just decoupling so that you can bias this capacitor without 
uh, shorting it through this analyzer. And so you put here power supply, you then, and this uh, first is a measurement with a film capacitor, not a ceramic. These are film capacitors, and poly propylene, and this is also a film capacitor, just to see the baseline. And when you do this, here is the ESR, this is the impedance, this is the ESR, for different voltages between zero and 350 volt, and it looks the same. No, no different, which is reasonable. But if I put in X7R, see what happens. Amazing. That is, first of all, we see here how the ESR is changing. The value is changing with uh, DC. This is one thing that I've talked about earlier. But then, as the voltage uh, builds up, the bias, uh, we see higher and higher uh, oscillations here, which is kind of uh, very interesting and very important. And again, this is something which is not very well uh, documented. And I think this is information that could be uh, important because if you happen to um, deal with frequency around this value, then you can be in big trouble. And uh, the the person. Uh, student now an engineer, he finished, he wrote his thesis, uh, Hermann Hag, uh, did something furthermore. He first of all measured this uh, oscillations uh, through the ESR by this circuit. Again, it's basically taking the unit and biasing and then measuring it with the analyzer, uh, the uh, impedance. But he did also something very elaborate, uh, which is very important, because we all know that, uh, well, let me go back, 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 back. We all know that uh, if you like to estimate the loss of a resistor, of a capacitor, you say, okay, it's IRMS times uh, ESR. Nobody verified it ever. That is, nobody actually measure to see if this is correct. You think, well, that's okay. But you see, ESR is measured with small signal. And now you're exposing with, with millivolts and milliamps, and then you're exposing the capacitor to amps, and you say, okay, that's it. So he took the time, well, student, thesis, and uh, did an elaborate measurement on in the area which I just talked about, and that is uh, this area, or this area here. And after measuring with small signal, with an analyzer, analyzer is by definition small signal set of, of uh, instrument, he exposed it, it, it put the capacitor into a real converter, this is the buck converter, took the capacitor and put it into a calorimetric chamber that was first calibrated by a resistor that passing current through it and plotting or, or finding the relationship between temperature rise and power dissipation, and then exposed this uh, unit, the capacitor, in the um, inverter, in the converter, and did the measurement and measured the temperature of that developed here due to the dissipation of uh, this of this capacitor in the circuit. And what he found, the good news is that indeed you can use the ESR. This is the ESR in this area, okay? This is the uh, higher ESR. Uh, so the good news is that indeed you can use the ESR. The one is measured and one is calculated with the ESR. I don't know which uh, it says here. Uh, blue is uh, measured and red is uh, calculated from the equation. And he saw that they are pretty good. But the bad news is that in this area, uh, if you hit, uh, if you are close to a peak, the dissipation is much higher. 
It's, it's more than three times, it's about three times higher, and this is just in one example, okay? So, as I've said, there's to a capacitor more than meets the eye. There's more information. We are missing this information. I hope uh, vendors and uh, manufacturer will provide them. And um, will be, um, I mean, perhaps uh, available uh, in the future in the uh, data sheet. I think I sort of uh, exhausted my time. Uh, let's see. I did not hear. I'll, I'll what? 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. So, let me wrap up with something which is a uh, little bit more theoretical, but I think it's also important for practical engineers, practicing engineers, I should <laughs> say, uh, to understand and uh, perhaps use. And that is, what is a capacitor? Especially when it is non-linear. Now, as I've said, I brought this example. You see, here it says capacitance, here it says capacitance, here is a voltage excitation. This is a large signal excitation between zero, then 0 0.4, 0 0.8, uh, 1 1.2 volts, one kilohertz. And this is also measured at one kilohertz. But here is something else, you see the different, this is now DC. And here you have a peak. So what's going on here? So the point is that there's some confusion, and I'm going back uh, to uh, introduction to electrical engineering, I guess uh, many of you have already forgotten, uh, to a state space equation of a capacitor. What is a capacitor? We know capacitor is, is defined by this equation. I is C, dV dt, but what happens if this capacitor is not constant? It is voltage dependent. Now, should we take this, multiply it first, and then take the derivative? Or should we use it this way? If we take multiply this and take the derivative, we end up with this equation. And if we take this on outside, it's a different equation. So if I like to model a uh, simulate even a capacitor, a variable capacitor, which one should I use? Well, it turns out, and I'm already bringing you to the end, and I'm showing it, sh I'll show it, that both are correct. The question is the definition of capacitor. And the point is that the fundamental relationship is not capacitance, but is this. This is coming from the uh, uh, polarization curve. Q as a function of V. This is the basic relationship of a device that stores energy. And then, if this relationship is a straight line, then this is a linear capacitor, there's no problem. But then if it is not, we have a number of capacitances here, definition. There is this derivative capacitor, or local capacitance, which is changing all over, of course. Then we can talk about total capacitance, which is like take this point and take Q over V. This is total capacitance. And then we can talk about large signal capacitance, and that is when you go all the way from here to here, which is not exactly the slope here, but just between these two points. And then there's another capacitor, which I'm not showing, which is energy-related capacitor, which is telling us how much energy is stored in the capacitor. So the difference between this and this is that, or let me say it in other words, there is a big mistake here that, that, that it's not designated here. What is this capacitor? It should have been written here. This is a local or small signal capacitor. And here it should have said large signal capacitor. 
And then you can understand that small signal is something like this. Large signal, which is about, again, around zero. It could be large signal here too, but this is around zero, <coughs> is different. But still, there is a mystery here. What, why is there a peak? Why is there a peak? And it turns out, okay, this is again uh, just showing uh, that from this definition, you come up with these two equations, as I've said. Um, if you start with this definition of the derivative, you come up with this state space equation, and this is the derivative capacitance, while if you talk about the total capacitance, then uh, you come up with this equation, and this capacitance is different. It's another capacitance, an another value. Okay, so this is the difference, and there's of course a relationship between them. So, so the question is, why is this peak? Well, it's a very interesting, very intriguing. It turns out that this curve, Q over uh, as a function of V, it's not starting from zero, it's starting like that. Okay? This is very typical. You see it also in a ferromagnetic material. If you look at the hysteresis, it doesn't go up. It's first there's the initial permeability, as we call it, and then it starts to go up. So when you talk about large signal now, and this is large signal here, obviously you see a slope here, you see a slope here, you see a slope here. As then it turns out, these slopes look like this because of this curvature. So this explains why we have a peak here, which is due to the fact that this in an initial uh, position uh, point of the QV curve, uh, it starts like this. And we can see it, barely can see it here. This is something that I've actually taken from data sheet and plotted Q as a function of V walking out from data of a data sheet, actually from a derivative capacitance or local capacitance and then calculated or found the large signal capacitance. And you can see, you can barely see it here by eye, but when you do it uh, numerically, you indeed can see this uh, peak. So this explains this peak. I think uh, by this I just about uh, finished my time. I hope you found it interesting. And uh, if there are any questions, of course, I'll be more than happy to answer. The future. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Thank you very much. So, if there are questions, that's good. If no, just go ahead. Okay.